Father, I have never felt the need of you like I feel the need of you now. Standing on the precipice of a new millennium, in the midst of a people who are confused, confounded, criticized, ridiculed, held back, pushed down, and grasping for all the wrong answers, I ask you to help me tonight. Like Jeremiah walking through the streets of Jerusalem, help me. Like Isaiah who cried loud and spared not, help me to show your people their transgression, the house of Jacob their sin. Let there be courage from another world. Clarity of thought. Satan, you're bound. Rendered helpless. Do that which we cannot do, Lord. Convince us of righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I am so thankful to see you all. I believe there are folks here from all 50 states and over 20 nations already. We thank God for you. We're glad you're here. Bishop T.D. Jakes called me just a few hours ago said the Lord had stirred his heart and for me to tell you you're in the right place at the right time and you're about to hear the right message I want to say thank you to all the World Harvest Church Ministerial Fellowship Council members to the elders of this church to its ministers to its leadership to my family I have never been more clearly aware of my assignment than I am tonight. I didn't come to entertain you. I didn't come to give you a plan of how to get more people in your church. I came to incite a riot. I came to start a revolution. I came to make some of you mad. Because God is mad. With righteous indignation. He looks toward what we commonly refer to as the church. I have never been more acutely aware of why it's taken me 22 years for God to truly bring to bear upon my spirit why he called me why he anointed me why he would raise up a place like this in the middle of the cornfield in the north of the United States far away from the Bible Belt I have become acutely aware of why there is a World Harvest Bible College and why there is a World Harvest Church and why there is a World Harvest Christian Academy and why there is something called Breakthrough. Why there's a Dominion Camp meeting. Why a Raise the Standard Pastors and Church Leaders Conference. I have never been more clearly aware of my assignment than I am tonight. 
And so, whatever you came thinking you were going to see, <laughs> he ain't alive no more. He's a dead man. I have surrendered to the revelation of my assignment before God. And though I would like your applause, I'm not preaching for it tonight. <laughs> Isaiah 58, 12. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. They shall build up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. May I draw your attention just momentarily to that statement, they that shall be of thee. Because I think that it's imperative from the onset of my discourse with you tonight for you to clearly understand that I did not come in here with the delusion that my assignment is to speak to everybody. Some of y'all don't even know why you're here. Some of you are here because you made a decision to be. I'm not talking to you. Some of you read the brochure and you said, well, if I can get into that pastor's conference, maybe I can learn how to have a little league and maybe I can learn about children's ministry, how to have Bozo the Clown and Fufu the Dog and maybe I can understand how to make my parking lots more accessible so that I can get more human beings sitting in my pews so that my ego can be stroked and maybe even I could get on Charisma Magazine, maybe, if I went there and handed out enough of my cards, somebody would invite me to preach that would introduce me to somebody, that would introduce me to somebody, that would introduce me to somebody so that I could feel like somebody. I didn't come looking for preachers who want to feel like somebody. I came trying to find a preacher who don't want to be nobody. I got to find me somebody that if God called, will answer, here am I, before they find out how much they're going to get paid for it, before they find out if they're going to get to live in Los Angeles, California, or in Honolulu, Hawaii, I've got to find me somebody that don't have to have a new Cadillac. to preach us gospel, good God Almighty. I gotta find me somebody that don't care if God calls them to bushwhack Indiana back in the hills so far that they gotta use hoot owls for roosters. I gotta find me somebody that don't wanna know what the paycheck is and don't even care whether they get one. I got I gotta find me a man They don't have to have somebody pay his way. Got to find me somebody knows how to eat locusts and wild honey. Got to find me somebody coming down out of the mountain with their face shining like the noonday sun. Got to find me somebody that don't have to be healed to preach this gospel. Got to find me somebody that don't care if they got a limp while they're preaching it because they had an encounter with the almighty God. Got to find me somebody that won't tuck tail and run. Got to find me somebody that doesn't want to bail out every time things get tough. Got to find me somebody that every time somebody come along, some pimp come along and offer them a little bigger church in a little bigger city are ready to abandon the sheep they said they were called to pastor. I got to find me somebody. I've done size. We're going to be here a while. Just get comfortable. 
I done sized some of you all up. You're not who I came to talk to. But somewhere out there, God help me. Somewhere out there, there's somebody that said, God, if you call me to 15 people in the backwoods somewhere, I'll be faithful. If nobody ever knows my name, if I don't ever get asked to preach at the big meeting, if I don't ever get a television program, if I'm never heard on radio, if nobody ever knows my name, but the 25 people you called me to pastor, I will be found faithful. Gotta find me a preacher that's not looking for a business manager. Gotta find me a preacher. Called, anointed, ordained. Gotta find me a preacher. Yes, yes. They're dying breed. Men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who would not bow and could not burn. God help me find somebody like Stephen that says stone me at midnight and I'll still have a soul gotta find me a man like Daniel that says throw me in the lion's den I'll reckon my position, turn my face toward Jerusalem, offer my prayer to God, and pillow my head in the shaggy mane of the lion, and sleep like a baby all night long. I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. The preacher. The preacher. Not a puppet, not a pulpiteer with the silvery tongued eloquence of a great orator, a preacher, not a teacher spoon feeding me a little bit of pablum, a preacher, a prophet, an apostle. Gonna find me some authority that is based in the bedrock of personal morality. A preacher. Just touch somebody. The man's talking about a preacher. A preacher. The medium upon which the heart of the infinite breaks into language. A preacher. A man through whom the voice of the infinite and his purpose are made to be heard. Somebody give me a towel or something other. A preacher. A man through whom the voice of the infinite and his purpose are made to be heard in all the indignation which is proper to its outrage. It's been so long since we've seen one, we don't rightly even know what one looked like. 
But I can tell you one thing, the greatest ones in this nation don't have their face plastered all over television. Most of you have never heard their name. They're sitting somewhere with 150 people, sitting somewhere with 300 people, sitting somewhere with 5,000 people, but ain't nobody knows their name. But they have become the guardians of the souls of humanity. God, I'm about to preach up in this house tonight. I got to hurry. I came to start a revolution. Every country and kingdom has been birthed on the battlefield of a revolutionary movement. These crusades have been championed by soldiers and citizens who refuse to be denied in their pursuit, you better hear me good tonight, to take up a cause they believe deserving of even death itself. A revolutionary movement is dependent upon the moral virtue of the people and becomes necessary when the virtue and intelligence or vice and ignorance of the people demand it. At that point, negotiation and compromise become void and a revolution is inevitable. Now the only way for evil to triumph as it has in America is for good men to do nothing. And the best men in America are not in politics. And the best men in America are not in education. And the best men in America are not bouncing a round ball up and down a hardwood floor. And the best men in America are not in the seats of science. And the best men in America can be found in one place and one place only. And that is being faithful to stand behind this sacred desk, receive a word from the infinite almighty God, and deliver it as of thus saith the Spirit of the Lord. Please sit down. Stop hanging your head, preacher. Stop being made to feel like some second-class citizen. Stop being made feel by Dr. Dumbbell with enough uh, alphabet after his name to be an alphabet soup. Just, just forget about all that stuff, you see, because you've got a hold of something that he will never find. He's always seeking, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth But all the preacher. The preacher deals in the merchandise of absolute truth. He lets nothing turn his plow. He doesn't back up because Dr. Ye Ye strokes his goatee and his smoke encircles a wreath around his head and says Jesus never lived. It doesn't matter if you only went to the seventh grade. If God called you and put his word in you, you're the smartest man walking this planet. I can get started. Shout a preacher. Kingdoms will crumble. Monuments will perish. Societies will collapse. The pyramids will melt away. Governments will topple. Armies will be defeated. But the work of the preacher will stand when the world is dying and the moon is bleeding and the seas are seething under the whiplash of fury to spill their dead in the lap of God. Preacher! Men and women will spend the endless ages of eternity in the bowels of a devil's hell or in the pavilion of the grandeur and the glory of Almighty God based upon your word. They will live or die based upon your life. That's right. Amen. 
we the epistles living epistles known and read of all men and though you shout loud with your words your life is drowning them out The reason America has gone as America has gone, don't you lay it at the feet of some pathetic little politician who got elected because he could kiss more babies than the other guy and shake more hands than the other guy and make more lying promises than the other guy. Don't you blame educators and situational ethics. Don't you blame homosexuals and lesbians and abortion doctors. If you would like to lay an indictment somewhere, let me point it out to you. Lay that indictment at the base of a powerless pulpit. As the preacher goes, so goes the church. As the church goes, so goes the nation. As the nation goes, so goes the world. You want to know why our teenagers are shooting each other? Don't you blame it on Hollywood? Don't you blame it on a video game? Don't you blame it on a rock and roll record? Don't you blame it on a rock and roll singer? Let me tell you why our children are blowing their brains out and shooting one another. Because they have had no gospel. And the reason the church is admired in modern society is the same because it has no gospel. We are accepted in every circle. Presidents call us and Larry King calls us and Newsweek calls us and Time Magazine calls us. Your mayor gives you the key to the city. I got a question for you. How come Paul never got one of them keys? The only key he got was one hanging on a jailer's side as they threw his beaten and battered carcass into the inward prison. We walk in town, we want the keys to the city. Paul walked in town, he wanted a prison cell. There's something amiss here. And the reason the church is so accepted, the reason they're not throwing dead cats at us anymore. Finney preached, they threw dead cats at him. And you won't preach lest they throw a thousand dollar bills at you. Now I gotta, I gotta clear this up. I didn't come talk to everybody. If I'm not talking to you, just use one of my tithing envelopes there and make out your laundry list. But I'm gonna find me somebody. Before we get out of here tonight, I'm gonna find me some preachers. I'm gonna grab me some preachers uh, out of being lulled to sleep and rocked to sleep in Zion, and I'm gonna shake you and stick you back in a pulpit with the authority that God ordains you with. What are y'all staring at me for? The only way for evil to triumph is for preachers to do nothing but stand up yonder and moan and groan and mess about and deliver some psychological I wish to God some of you throw your psychology books away and get yourself a Bible.
The only way we've gotten into the condition that we're in in this nation is because we've had a powerless pulpit for far too long. The only way for evil to excel is for good men to do nothing. The control of any dictator is directly linked to the endurance of those people whom he oppresses. Power concedes nothing without a demand. A brave man, negligent to his office, is of no more virtue than the coward that deserts in the time of gravest danger. I'm preaching. We're at a point of crisis. You haven't noticed it, but our culture is in chaos. The moral foundations which were once constructed by the tenets of our faith are crumbling around us with no sign of a cure. We're at a crossroads, a strategic inflection point. <laughs> we're faced with a choice. When complacency exceeds the desire for change, the consequence is concession and chaos. You better listen with your spirit. Amen. When complacency exceeds the desire for change, I got 300 people and they pay me real well and get me a new car every year. Why on earth would I want to say anything that would ever might be interpreted to offend them? So complacency exceeds your desire for change, and the result is concession and chaos. But when comfort and contentment no longer pacify the people, talk is no longer tolerated, and the cry, freedom at any cost, becomes the catalyst for confrontation and change. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at that point, the whole creation begins to groan under the pressure of giving birth to a revolutionary movement, uh, a genuine culture-shaking revival where the moral climate of our cities is changed and the effect is felt like shockwaves throughout the nation. Such a culture-shaking revival was apparent in the early church. Men and women that joined that church became martyrs. Yes. Yes. Men and women that joined that church became misfits. Men and women that joined that church became socially ostracized. Men and women that joined that church were mocked by the religious elitists of their day. But like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would not bow and they could not burn. I see the same fires beginning to burn today. I see a glorious church rising out of the blurs of indistinction. I perceive a remnant who will gladly lose their lives for a cause they believe to be greater than themselves. I don't want to be a politician. The cause is not great enough. I don't want to lead a nation. The cause is not great enough. I don't want to be a scientist and create a capsule that can take men to Mars. The cause is not great enough. I don't want to be a heart surgeon and lay the palpitating heart of a dying man in my hands and through skill and knowledge be able to put it back together, put it back in his chest and show him up and give him another 15 years of life. 
I'm not looking for an extension on this side of the river. I'm dealing in the merchandise of eternity. Have all the preachers gone? Where are some Johns, sons of thunder? Instead of your manicured nails, where is a preacher like Jesus willing to stick their arm and elbow deep? into the muck and mire of humanity and extract a helpless, hopeless, dying, destitute soul and give their life for them. Paul said, I would rather myself be cast into hell than for them not to hear my preaching. I don't think we got too many folk ready to go to hell for somebody. We can't even get to talk to you without going through 14 secretaries. There's no greater drama than a few remnant believers scorned by a succession of adversaries bearing trials with tenacity, multiplying miraculously, building order in chaos, all the while rescuing the despondent, redeeming the downtrodden, and reviving the life of Christ in the hearts of humanity. Oh, they're beaten and battered, but they are not bowed. They are propelled by power. of an inward desire to serve an infallible leader based on absolute truth with irresistible power. Mm -hmm. Remnant preachers. And so I began to be before the Lord. What, what is this thing that you have impregnated me with this revolution what does it mean now I'm not the smartest individual but I can read a dictionary if I get to some big words I don't understand just skip over shout revolution no I didn't say whisper it I said shout it What is a revolution? And I, and, and I went to Webster's Dictionary, and, and there it was, just staring back at me. <laughs> it's real deep, so hold on. It, it means to revolve. I'm going to hit this and skip and go on. Is that all right? And we might come back to it in the next couple of nights, but I, I'm going to just, I'm going to hit it and skip right now. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. And the violent take it by force. But you can't just read the Bible. You have to read the Bible. And you find out in the beginning of the verse that it says words along these lines. From the days of John the Baptist until now. We usually skip right over that. From the days of John the Baptist until now. From the days of John the Baptist until now. The kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. 
You cannot befriend your way into imposing Christ's kingdom in your city. See, you want the kingdom to be invited. But the kingdom is not going to be invited. The kingdom must be imposed. You don't, man of God, ask your mayor whether he likes it or not. You don't ask the people in your church whether they like it or not. You don't ask your board of directors whether they like it or not. Not if you're a man of God. Not if you're called of God. Not if you're anointed of God. You are God's man hearing God's voice. And let hell be barred to try to distract you from fulfilling that which God has placed within you. This kingdom doesn't get invited. Amen. Would you like to invite the Lord into your heart? No! Amen. For that to happen, we would have to have the mentality that this world belongs to Satan. It doesn't belong to Satan. He's an intruder here. He's a squatter. And he's on our property. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are the kingdom of almighty God. And I defy any devil to try to hold on to territory when God tells me to go and take it. God, I got to, I got to quit and I'm not started. A revolution. What does it mean? From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Paul didn't walk into a city and ask the devil if he would mind moving over. You better hear a preacher. Paul said, I went to Ephesus. Here is testimony. And I I fought the beast at Ephesus. He didn't say I had a gospel meeting. He didn't say I had a believer's meeting. He didn't say I talked to the church. He said I fought the beast. The devil was an intruder and Paul came to run him off. You see But I tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get me the socioeconomic tables of several cities before I decide where I'm gonna go pastor. I need to know what is the cost of living. How many days of sunshine there is. You ain't got no word. Stay. Let me tell you. I'm going to tell you the same thing Apostle Paul told John Mark. Go home, baby. Go home, you little snotty-nosed brat. Run back home to your mama. You ain't made of the right stuff yet. This is the way you preach to the Crow Nation. You don't walk in and say, would you all like to accept Jesus? You walk back into that reservation. You plant your feet. You lift up your hands and you declare, I'm the servant of God and I've come here to rout the enemy. I wish I could preach till midnight. I, this is one time I wish I could preach till midnight. Paul said, I've done been to Ephesus. I think I move on to Corinth. 
and you know God's word to him? Be not afraid. See, but you skip over that. Because I've heard God say to me, don't be afraid. And the reason he had to say that to me, because one knee was smiting against the other. I saw what lied ahead. I saw the encampment of the adversary. I heard their swords clanging out of their sheaths. I have felt the hot breath of the adversary bearing down upon my life. I have felt the pressure of imposing this kingdom where it was not wanted by the hordes of hell. And I can tell you there was no reason and for God to tell him not to fear unless there was something to be afraid of. Tell you another thing he said. I've got many in that city. Now he wasn't like you evangelists. Some of you can't pay your bills for being on the phone begging somebody to let you come preach. Whatever happened to the Bible saying a man's gift made room for him? Reason ain't no room for you, you ain't got no gift. Why don't you wake up? They ain't used to this. I don't care. Not my job to please you. Not my job to make you feel good. Not my job to increase your self-esteem. Why are we trying to increase the esteem of a self God told us to crucify? I'm gonna make me some preachers in here tonight. God being my help, I'm gonna make me some preachers in here. He didn't say it. So you would, you would interpret that, oh, there must be a lot of churches there. So the evangelist Paul will surely increase his mailing list there. He will make sure that the pastor will let him have the names off the offering so that he can then beg the people in the mail to increase his. He will surely at pastor's conference get a second dose of cards to hand out. have to get on national television and beg for a place to come and preach. No, that wasn't what, that wasn't what God was telling Paul. God didn't say, God, God didn't mean there's a lot of churches with steeples and little cookie cut Christians sitting in there for you to go preach to and fleece. That wasn't what he said at all. In fact, he wasn't even talking about the church. If you read 1 Corinthians, they were already backslidden. He wasn't talking about them when he said, I've got many in that city to that apostle when he was getting ready to go in there and impose the kingdom. You know what he was saying? I've got many. They're not really in yet, but they're mine, and I will have them. They're still sitting out there on a bar stool, but if you go impose the kingdom, I'll get what's mine. God's got many in your city, but they're not in your choir. And stop looking at them from somebody else's church and trying to come up with some program to lure them over to your place. You proselyter, sit down. We go into, you got an apostolic anointing in here tonight. I just tell you that right now. You go into a city, you don't start Sunday morning service. You start on, uh, how about, uh, uh, maybe Tuesday night. When ain't nobody else got church and you know it, because in the back of your mind is, you're going to try to lure them out of somebody else's church over to yours. That's not the ones he was talking about. He was talking about drug addicts and prostitutes. He was talking about people out playing the lottery. Yes, he was. They were his, and he would have them. If he could just get somebody to go impose the kingdom. I'm not to the text. 
You want to go home? I'll let you. I'll let you. Because I've been preaching this to myself for a month. I already know all of it. God, give us a preacher. Give us a man that don't have to ask denominational headquarters what they think about it. Give us a man. Give us a man that don't have to ask his wife what she thinks about it. Give us a man. All it takes to be what you call a preacher is a sermon. Anybody can build a sermon that's got the gift of gab. I'm not talking about that kind of preacher. All it takes for him is a sermon, but if you want to be a man of God, you're going to have to have you an altar somewhere. From the days of John the Baptist until now, it had only been a year and nine months. But so much was done in so little time when Christ was the sender. When it wasn't me and my ministry, it was him and his ministry. When it wasn't my word and my plan and my program and my intellect, when it was all of him and none of me. Oh, how rapidly the, the, the thousands were healed. How rapidly they were flushed into the kingdom of God by the multiplied tens of thousands because they were so close to Jesus. You see a revolution. That's what the earth does around the sun. You know the sun can never burn up because it creates its own energy which then burns and creates its own energy which then burns and creates its own energy which then burns and stay with me I'm not dizzy which then burns and creates its own energy. I'm talking about the gravitational pull of the exponential power that is available in the sun that holds the planets in their orbit that doesn't cause Jupiter to run into Saturn. No, no, no. There's an order. And the further out you go from the center, Mercury is that first planet. It goes around the sun in 88 days it only takes mercury 88 days what it takes the earth 365 days but it takes pluto you know why because it's so far from the center Mercury, the wing-footed planet. Mercury, over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface, burning and boiling. Mercury, because it's close to the center. But then you get out to the Earth and... So much was done in so little time when Christ was the sender. When it wasn't me and my ministry, it was him and his ministry. When it wasn't my word and my plan and my program and my intellect, when it was all of him and none of me. Oh, how rapidly the... the the thousands were healed how rapidly they were flushed into the kingdom of God by the multiplied tens of thousands because they were so close to Jesus. You see a revolution. That's what the earth does around the sun. You know the sun can never burn up because it creates its own energy which then burns and creates its own energy which then burns and creates its own energy which then burns and stay with me I'm not dizzy which then burns and creates its own energy. Which then burns and 
I'm talking about the gravitational pull of the exponential power that is available in the sun that holds the planets in their orbit that doesn't cause Jupiter to run into Saturn. No, no, no. There's an order. And the further out you go from the center, Mercury is that first planet. It goes around the sun in 88 days. It only takes Mercury 88 days. What it takes the Earth 365 days. But it takes Pluto. You know why? Because it's so far from the center. Mercury, the wing-footed planet. Mercury, over 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit on the surface, burning and boiling. Mercury, because it's close to the center. But then you get out to the Earth, and it's a little cooler out there. If we were closer to the sun, we'd burn up. If we were further from the sun, we would be frozen to death. When you get all the way out there to Pluto, it's just a little frozen ball of gases and ain't nothing can live out there because it's too far removed from the center. Can I tell you something? The church has gotten so far removed from Jesus that it takes 3,000 church members one full year to win one person to Jesus. But I got news for you. We're getting closer to his return. And the closer we get to him, the faster things are going to happen. The faster the healings, the faster the deliverance, the faster... What took me 22 years to build, some of you are going to build in 22 months. What it takes them 22 months to build, some of you are going to build in two days. God. I told you I was just going to hit it and skip. I got a question for you, preacher. Where are you drifting? You used to feel the need of him before you mounted a pulpit till you had to go in the bathroom, toss your cookies, your nerves crawling all over you, your palms sweating, your heart palpitating. You recognize the awesome inability of yourself and at the same time the grandeur of his ability in you. Oh, if you could just get God to come. If you could just get God to pick up your body like Gideon and put you on. If God could just clothe himself with you. One word would shake a million demons from helpless humanity. Oh, do you remember? but you got everything you need now. You already got a crowd. You got a good PA system now. You done moved uptown. You ain't having to, you ain't having to bleed for your bread no more. You've manipulated a bunch of big bucks in your congregation to the point that they're taking woo good care of you. as you stand there and command the people to tithe and you don't. I'm preaching. Pitiful excuse for preaching. But I found out revolution means another thing. It means, watch me now. I wish I could forget about time. Watch me now. Watch me. It means, it means you were here when you started. And a revolution means you got to come all the way back to where you started.
You got to get that childlike faith back. You got to get that utter dependency back. You got to get that God. If you don't give me a word to say, I ain't got nothing to say. You got to tear up all your sermon notes and throw them away and start all over again. You got to you got to get back in your prayer chamber and start all over again. You got to throw everybody else's tapes away, including your own, and just start all over again, bare and raw. Just get back where you were. And if we can get the preacher back where he was, uh, we can get the church back where it was. Can't you? Somebody shout for me. I can't shout. come in here to deliver a sermon. I came in here to deliver a baby. I'm trying to... Oh, I was on an airplane. The Holy Ghost came to me God had brought to bear upon me the, the weight of my assignment let me tell you a thing if all I want to do is get a crowd I've been around I know how to get a crowd I can get a crowd I can teach you how to get a crowd. But I don't want a crowd. I don't care nothing about a crowd. We got too many folk looking for a crowd. Loving the crowd and hating the people. We've got too many. I don't want that. Take it all. Take it all and give me Jesus. I have decided I'm going to follow Jesus. I don't need your Wall Street marketing experts. I want to follow Jesus. I want to say what it tells me to say. I don't want to preach for results. It's your problem. You're always preaching for results. And it's making you drift off track. God never called you to preach for results. God called you to say what he told you to say when he told you to say it, how he told you to say it, to whom he told you to say it. Results are none of your business. Jesus didn't say, I'll go to the cross if... He said, my father told me to climb up on this beam, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. He went into the, on that beam and into a tomb, and they sealed him in. And the world said he was wrong. And you can't stand it unless somebody comes up and strokes you about how good your sermon was. Everybody thought he had failed. He looked like a failure. But he said, I'm going to the cross. I'll leave the results to my father. And you know what you need to do? You need to go to the pulpit like it was a cross. You need to preach like a dying man to dying men. You need to preach like there is no tomorrow. You need to preach like that's your last opportunity and somebody's going to hell if you don't stop them. And if it makes the crowds come, that's nothing to you. And if everybody leaves, that's nothing to you. You preach his word and leave the results to him. We 
got to get back. There is much to be gained by return to the discarded values of the past. Now, I'm going to give you in the next 15 minutes what has shaken my life as it has never been shaken in 22 years. I was preaching in a major auditorium, 10,000 people in attendance. I was preaching from a very familiar text. In John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3. You believe in God, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. That where And if I go, I will return again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Everybody was shout. Dance. Run in the aisles. Until I went to preaching. What that text meant. I went to preaching. About a time. When two will be in the field, one taken, one left. Two will be grinding at the mill, one taken, one left. I started preaching about a place called heaven. I was preaching about these old folks who uh, the underpinnings have all gone out of them and their silvery hair, their gray, their raven black hairs turned silvery gray and their skin no longer taut on their face. And I talked about that there was going to come a time when they would leap like a heart over the everlasting hills of God to suffer no more, to cry no more, to sigh no more, to die no more. And I was trying to preach about the blessed hope And they cut me off. Started looking in their purses for mints. They cut me off. You know why? Because all they've had for 20 years is a self-help gospel of humanism that deals in the merchandise of the temporalness of this present world. This me gospel. Me, my house. Me, my gifts. Me, my children. Me, my marriage. Me, 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 me. We have taken the infinite eternity and reduce the gospel to some philosophic, psychological self-help program in a temporal, hell-bound world. Preacher, stop me afterwards. You don't really believe that, do you? Believe what? Well, you don't really believe like streets of gold and stuff. Oh, no, no. Yeah, see, you, you frown, but if I told you their name, most of you support him every month. Come on. But, but, but you don't know what he preaches. You never bothered to pay any attention. He's so busy helping you feel better about yourself that you have no earthly idea that he drinks three bottles of wine at dinner. and called himself a bishop. Come on. Bishop. Bishop. Somebody said to me the other day, this bishop so-and-so. I said, bishop of what? Bishop of what? What are you the bishop of? Are you the bishop, the husband of one wife? That bishop? Are you the bishop that rules his house well and has his children under subjection? Are you that bishop? 
Are you that bishop that's not given to wine? Are you that bishop? Are you that bishop that's apt to teach? Are you that bishop? Are you that bishop that's given to hospitality? Are you that bishop? Are you that bishop that has a good report of them without? Are you that bishop? Are you the bishop that has a good report of them within? Are you the bishop that First and Second Timothy in the book of Titus talk about? I'd like to meet you. But if you're just some bishop, I had a man offend me from a national publishing house sitting in my own office, coming around courting me. We'd like to give you a $50,000 check, Pastor Parsley, little advancement here, like if you'd write a book for us. But now, now what we need to do, see, what we need to do is you need to drop this pastor thing. See, we need to, we need to get you another title. Let me tell you my title. Preacher! I'm a preacher. I'm a preacher. A bona fide, died in the wool, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, fire breathing preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And don't you degrade my office by telling me I need some other type. But most of you, that has stroked your ego so big. Oh, yeah, that's what I do need. <laughs> Brother, elder, bishop, reverend, doctor. <laughs> Sit down. It's my meeting. I'll preach as long as I want to. I preach till he says quit. Come on now. Now, you excuse me, but I'm a preacher. I am the medium upon which the heart of God breaks into language and through which the purpose of the infinite is made to be heard in all the indignation which is proper to its outrage. I'm a preacher. I don't have no time to trifle with you about silly questions that gender strife dealing in the merchandise of this temporal, cursed planet. Don't tell me the thing's not cursed. If it wasn't cursed, God wouldn't have to burn it up. And he's already told you he's going to burn it up. So y'all go ahead and get it in the best shape you can because the Holy Ghost about to light a match to the whole business. Well, you know, we don't want to be so heavenly-minded. We're no earthly good. Now, can, can, excuse me. We can take this out of the tape. That's just plumb stupid. You can't be so heavenly-minded that you're no earthly good. Because the greater glimpse you get of that other world, the more good you want to do to get somebody out of this mess and over there. Preaching. They wouldn't hear me preach, turn me off. Didn't want to hear nothing about heaven. Didn't want to hear nothing about no rapture. Set up on Christian TV and say we are the preachers of a new millennium. We have no business mentioning the subject of sin. I don't guess you want anybody to mention it. Sitting in a hotel watching Playboy and drinking Budweiser. I don't guess you do want anybody to mention it. Well, now, he ought not talk like that. He ought not talk like that about the brethren. They ain't my brethren. No, you missed something. You missed something. I don't have to belong to your little ecumenical boys club. I could care less whether you ever invite me to preach or not. And pay my way.
you don't believe the blood, you're not my brother. You don't believe the cross, you're not my brother. You don't believe in holiness, you're not my brother. You don't believe in straight and narrow, you're not my brother. You don't believe in heaven, you're not my brother. You don't believe in hell, you're not my brother. Jesus said, I'll remind you, he that is not for us is against us. There is a holy indignation which is proper to the outrage of God himself. I'm, over, I'm making me preachers in here all over the place. They're just, they're just popping like popcorn. I'm making me some preachers. Here it is. Here it is. I said, God. God. What's going on? And God said, we have replaced. You know, in a lot of churches, they don't even put the pulpit in the center anymore. Put it over there on the side. And when you, and when you move that preacher out of there, and you've replaced him with something else, you're lost. You're lost. what's happened we're living among a people that if somebody gets on Christian television and says there's no rapture people sit and applaud if I go back the next night and preach on the rapture the same people will sit in the same seats and you know why and I'm only using the rapture as one example you know why because they don't know nothing. Now I'm going to fix you. They don't know nothing. Does anybody remember in a return to the discarded values of the past where like the Athenians, Paul said, you're always running about trying to know some new thing. What's your revelation? What's your deep revelation? What's your new thing? What's your revelation? What's your... And most of it not revelation at all. It was too much pizza before they went to bed. It's not a revelation. Some crazy thing. Prominent doctrine going around right now that John 14 doesn't really mean heaven, that heaven is just figurative, that actually we can't understand God, so we're just going to move into the being of God. Whatever God is, that's what we're going to become, and we don't really know what it is. So there are really no streets of gold, and there are really no mansions. Let me tell you something. Ira Stanfield said it best. I don't know about you, but I've got a mansion. just over the hills high in that bright land where we'll never grow old and someday yonder we'll never more wonder but walk on streets that are paved made of gold Mansions will glisten on the hillsides of glory. Happy reunion on streets made of gold. Angel choir singing glad praises forever. But Jesus will outshine them. Now, sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Does anybody remember in a return to the discarded values of the past, in a revolution to get back where we started. Does anybody remember, am I the only one that ever went to something they called Sunday school? Anybody ever go to Sunday school? Let me, let me refresh your memory. Stanky church basement. Bird egg blue paint on the concrete cinder block wall. Does anybody remember Sunday school? Does anybody remember Sister Gillicuddy? A 
Sister Gillicuddy, who had not learned yet that they had made undergarments for the upper hemisphere of the female anatomy. Sister Gillicuddy, she got that waddle down there hanging down about 14 inches. Just Sister Gillicuddy. Does anybody remember Sister Gillicuddy? Does anybody remember a light blue flannel graph? Now, Sister Gillicuddy, she didn't wear her dress up about 14 inches above her knee. No, 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 no. Sister Gillicuddy, she didn't go to tanning bed. No, not Sister, no. Sister Gillicuddy, you couldn't call her on Saturday night on the gossip line because she is busy getting her Sunday school quarterly ready because she had three snot-nosed kids in there the next day, and it was her responsibility to teach them the gospel. Sister Gillicuddy. Sit down. Uh huh. Sister Gillicuddy. She didn't run around talking about her ministry. No, no, no. No. She just had some scrawny little kid, more knees and elbows than anything else. One of that hillbilly bunch of parsleys down yonder underneath the church in the basement. And it was her responsibility to teach me Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. She made me memorize. You know why? I know. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. If I go away, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. You know where I learned that. Sister Gillicuddy. Yeah. People ask me all the time, how do you quote all that stuff? Well, I didn't start yesterday. What university? What the Bible say? What seminary did you graduate from? Gillicuddy. I went to Gillicuddy. I graduated with honors from Gillicuddy. Sister Gillicuddy. And you didn't call her nothing but Sister Gillicuddy, neither. Because she would teach you discipline and she would teach you how to act in the house of God and she would teach you respect for authority, respect for God, respect for his word, respect for his man, respect for his church. Sister Gillicuddy. doing my short sermon tonight. I got some long ones the next two nights. We don't have Sister Gillicuddy no more. No, because we can't find none. We can't find nobody willing to go sit in the church basement and talk to the Rod Parsley's of the next generation. We can't find one. They all too busy with their notepads and tape series. No, so we can't have that no more. Now we got some called Junior Church. And we replace Sister Gillicuddy with Blooms and Bozo the Clown and Foo Foo the Dog. And the problem is our children don't know nothing. We didn't have no blooms. No, sir. We didn't have no blooms. At Easter time, my daddy had a ping pong table in the basement made out of a sheet of two of four by eight plywood set up on some saw benches. 
put a net on it, called it a ping pong table. And every Easter time, my mother and the church ladies would all get around that ping pong table and take baggies and make us a treat for Easter time. That was the only day Sister Gillicuddy would let anything interrupt her class. See, she is on an assignment. She was going to make a preacher that would preach to 97% of the households of America and 78% of the households of Canada and 300 nations of the world. She had to make her a preacher. Now, don't go out of here and say, well, Pastor Powers, they said, we're saying if we use a balloon. No, I didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. I'm trying to show you what's happened. What's happened? Ain't nobody making your children learn memory verses. They're in there shooting water balloons and having a good time. They ain't learning nothing. They think the epistles, the wives of the apostles, they don't know nothing. I heard one of them say the other day they'd read the Bible from Job to Malachi. They don't know the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, most of you don't know the Ten Commandments. Most preachers don't know that one about adultery. They missed that one. They're lying. How many you got in your church? 42,000. How many you see? 12. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute now. Wait. You'd have to have 192 services a day. I come to preach for you, and then you take your offering and receive mine, and then shave yours off top of mine. Ain't nobody in America brave enough to talk like this. You know what I learned in youth group? I'm a product of one of the greatest youth groups in the world. You know what we learned in the youth group? How to praise God, how to pray, and how to witness. That's all. We didn't have no video games. Didn't have none. We got our fun out imposing the kingdom. Yeah. You know what? I, I tried all that stuff. I tried all that stuff. You know what happened? The good kids started acting like the bad kids. I said, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this. This is going the wrong way. Oh, we had nearly 2,000 kids in there. And I told them to shut the thing down. I'd rather have 200 that knew how to get a hold of God as 2,000 coming in there looking after some girl to go date in the back of the church and get her pregnant. You don't understand what I'm talking about. Now, I'm not saying that in and of themselves any of those things are wrong. But what we've done, we've replaced the preacher. We've replaced doctrine. So our kids don't know nothing. Our young people don't know nothing. And then music. Oh, you don't want me to go there. No, you don't want me to talk about music. Every song we sing, we are, we are, we are. How about some stuff like, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. How about at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I'm happy all the day. How about amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I see. How about something with some teeth in it? How about my sin? Can you imagine having a contemporary gospel song about my sin? 
Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not just part, but the whole, is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way. When sorrows, like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, oh, that'd go over good in preaching today. Whatever my lot, you don't even know where that song came from. A great missionary on a boat with his family to a foreign land. The boat caught fire and capsized and was sinking. Holding on to a piece of driftwood as he heard his daughter and wife burning to death inside that boat. Held on to a piece of driftwood. And in his mind began to write those words. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. When the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The Lord shall descend. The trumpet shall sound. Even so, it is well with my soul. bring it around now. I got to bring it around now. You excuse me because I'm possessed. I didn't say it to be funny. I'm possessed. I got to promise God. I promised God. I said God has gone too far. We'll never get it back. God said the results are not your responsibility. You say what I told you to say when I tell you to say it to whom I tell you to say it and you leave the results to me. And I got to believe that in every generation God's had a remnant. I've got to believe he's still got an Elijah and Elisha. He's still got a Shadrach, a Meshach and Abednego. He's still got 3,000 that have not yet bowed their knee to Baal. Sit down. Here's the worst indictment of all. When Christian television first began, there were no Christian stations to speak of. There was, there was ABC, NBC, CBS. And most folks had rabbit ears and you had to actually get up from the sofa and go change the channel. <laughs> on Sunday morning and Sunday night, or Sunday morning from seven in the morning till noon, you tune across any of those stations and you'd find a preacher <laughs> calling America out of its sin-sick condition. But that went by the wayside largely used as a tool of evangelism in its infancy. Christian television then gave us celebrity. Now you see, you have to understand with your spirit tonight, because I have a youth program that has video games. And we have junior church. And we have music. And this ministry's on television. I'm just telling you what God said to me.
all of a sudden, with the celebrity, came a desire to keep the crowd. And so we translated preaching away and replaced it largely with the fivefold ministry office gift of teaching Christians. But we had to be careful because our audience was so much broader that people that believed in the Trinity dare not preach it on television lest some folks that didn't believe in the Trinity stop supporting their ministry. You see, you, you don't know what most Christian ministers with any form of what you would deal in as success, you really don't even know what they believe. Because most of them won't tell you. Maybe they don't believe in the Trinity but they won't tell you. When's the last time you heard a good message on sin? Wait a minute. Most of them are Pentecostal. Most of them have in their doctrine the baptism in the Holy Spirit. When's the last time you heard one of them preach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit or pray over television for people to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit? When's the last time? You can't name it. You can't name it. We have reduced Understandably so. We have reduced what is projected through the camera in our celebrity to the masses, to spiritual pablum. I heard one on the other day telling us how to put our shopping carts back. Marriage seminar after marriage seminar. How come you got to take Holy Ghost filled, five baptized believers and have marriage seminars? Why? That's elementary. Why do we have to teach you how to pray? Nobody taught the Christians in the book of Acts how to pray. See, now you're getting mad at me. Now you're starting to turn me off. No, because you don't understand. The preacher does not deal in the merchandise of the surface and extremities. The gospel preacher puts his hand on the heart of humanity and announces, this is my mission. If I get the heart right, I won't... I get your heart right, you won't be coveting my wife. I get your heart right, I won't have to teach you how to give. I get your heart right, I won't have to teach you how to be healed. I get your heart right, I won't have to teach you how to pray. We're dealing on the surface because we're afraid to dive into the heart of the matter and be a Samuel and stand up in front of Israel and say as a lone man standing on a mountain pointing his finger at a nation and a church and simply saying, you are wrong. Dear God in heaven, Larry King invites preachers on to talk about a man in the highest secular office in the free world who has little enough self-control than to take an intern into the Oval Office and have oral sex. And you know what the preachers say? Well, we need to, we need to exercise forgiveness. Well, I ain't heard him repent yet. Come on. I thought, no, he said he was sorry. That don't have anything to do with repentance. But don't blame Mr. Clinton. The man, when he was nine years old, tucked a Bible under, under his arm and walked for two miles and asked God if he should go into the gospel ministry. And when he met with his pastor, 
His pastor said, I think you ought to ascribe to a higher calling. His pastor, who was a Marxist, he was raised listening to a preacher preaching eternal security and telling him if you were saved and you committed an act in your flesh it had nothing to do with the eternal salvation of your spirit that is gnosticism and it is a plague in the body of christ What if he had had a preacher, a medium upon which the heart of God broke into language? What if he'd had a preacher that told him the highest calling in the world to use his God-given charisma for would be to put a microphone in one hand and a Bible in the other and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? What if he'd had a man that told him oral sex outside of marriage is no different than intercourse outside of marriage? It is sin. It is adultery. It is an abomination before God. But the problem was he had no preacher. And then the ones that ought to know something set up on Larry King, well, we ought to get, we ought to just be forgiving. And, you know, the gospel is just forgiving. It's just forgiving. It's just forgiving. Where was a prophet? Where was a voice? Now, let me tell you what we've done. Let me tell you what we've done. We have equated being on television with success. Now I'm going to stagger this entire crowd. And if I had my sense about me, I'd never say it. But I didn't come. I don't have the opportunity to say what I'd like to say. I'm under a covenant. I'm a preacher. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what it takes to be on TV. See, when I go to ABC or any Christian station, they never have one time asked me if I was anointed. They never have one time asked me if I was called. They never one time asked me, did I have a word from God? They never one time asked me what my personal morals were what my personal life was like. You know the only thing they asked me? Can you pay the bill? Show me the money. I can go on as many stations right now as I can pay for. I could spend $10 million next week and not bat an eye. And would nobody ask me if I loved my wife. So everybody pays the bill, then they get on TV. And then when they get on TV, now here's the tragedy, here's the tragedy, here's the tragedy. If you don't hear anything else tonight, and I know I've said a lot, if you don't hear anything else tonight, hear this. The tragedy is that we think that it's that that will win America. Now I gotta tell you a thing. The people up there have an assignment but you better hear me every church person in this building hear me stand up pastor Harrison stand up pastor stand up St give me some pastor. stand up stand up pastor Trice stand up cow stand up do you see men the where do you pastor Atlanta Edmonton Alberta Texas Kentucky, Kansas City, Huntington, West Virginia, Norman, Oklahoma. Let me show you something. I want everybody to hear me, and I want to put this on national television. Don't you cut it out. I am not the guardian of your soul. These men are the guardians 
of your soul. These men, these men, these men, they are your pastors. And God intends to do everything he does through the apostolic authority of the local church in this hour. These are the guardians of your soul. Be seated. Be seated. The tragedy is this. And I promised God I'd say it if he gave me the opportunity. We sit and we watch that. And because as a local pastor, we equate that with success, we think we have to preach the same kind of sermons that they preach. And since they ain't preaching nothing but pablum and ear tickling philosophies and vain deceits, then you turn around and preach what they preach. First of all, that would be wrong if everything they were preaching is right because that assignment is different. I do not preach to this church the way that I'll preach in Huntington, West Virginia. This is my church. I'm the guardians of their, guardian of their souls. I'm responsible before God. I have to preach doctrine. I have to preach eternal judgment. I have to preach repentance from dead works. I have to preach on baptisms. I have to preach on end time. I have to preach on holiness. This assignment is different. Under God, be a man of God. Your number one assignment is to get along with God and receive a message in secret that he declares through you in public. Your number one assignment is not to watch somebody and try to imitate and try to emulate what they say. Your number one assignment is to walk out into the presence of the people with a thus saith the spirit of the Lord. your heart to break into a million pieces? Do you want your family to forsake you and your friends to turn their backs on you? Do you want to be misunderstood and laughed at? You want the newspapers in your city to write your accolades or flaming missiles? You want to be a preacher? If you can do anything else and live, do it. I beg you. Do it. Sell cars. Sell real estate. Be a banker. Go into politics. Do anything. But if you're not called under God, don't do this. One hundred days, and we embark into a new millennium. But the message has never changed. The soul that sinneth, it 
that shall die. Do you go to bed hearing them? Do they wake you? Does the thought of their perishing make you walk the floor? Or is the gospel just a business to you? Just a way to pay your bills. God calls some preachers tonight. Call some men of bravery to stand up and point the way. Oh, there's so much that I have to tell you. I wish I had you for 30 days, not just three. How did we get so far from him? Pastor, if you took a survey in your congregation, what kinds of things do you think they know? Do they know about eternal judgment? Or do you dare never mention that? Are you preaching for results? I preached in a church not long ago, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with you. Then maybe the Holy Ghost will let me go. This particular preacher thanked me. They said, weeping. I used to preach like that. But then I started getting invited to a lot of big meetings. And they said, you know, if you preach that popular message that's so trite and so trivial, those thousands of people scream and they clap and they laugh and they jump and they run. And they said, this preacher said, it's intoxicating. Knowing that they like you like that. And weeping. They said, pray with me that I'll preach the truth again. it's so hard to preach the truth. God help us not to sell out. And I want to make you a promise. I've made it to you before. If I can't preach what God tells me to preach, they can take me off every station. And I'll stand right here in this pulpit and preach. Doesn't matter. I'm not going to compromise. Now there is room for teaching to the body of Christ. And there is room for all sorts of ministry. But if you really look, everybody seems to have gone the same way. good message on holiness how about a good message on Moses gave you letters of divorcement because of the hardness of your heart but I give you no such levity but I say unto you that if a man look upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery in his heart boy wouldn't that go over big on Christian TV 
You see how far we've come. People almost laugh when a man says, I've been married to this woman for 42 years. I hear you, doctor. He wants me to tell you, it's not hard to live right. It's not hard to love God with all your heart. Whoever he's given you to be the guardian of their soul would just sell out for them tonight would just say Lord if I never mount a platform with more than 500 people in attendance I'll be faithful to you I'll say what you want me to say I'll say it in love but God, I'll say what you want me to say. I'll hear your voice. I'll speak your word. And I'll leave the results up to you. He calls ministers to be fishers of men. That's not a call to luxury. It's a call to toil to labor, to sacrifice, to pain. He is no shepherd who sends the sheep out to test the waters, but an hireling and no lover of the sheep. He's calling somebody tonight. God, we had great success in the body of Christ when we preached being born again, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, divine healing, the second coming. God, lay your hands on somebody tonight. Do it. If he's calling you, if like Samuel in Eli's house, you can hear him. And you can say, I hear the voice of God. He's called. And I want to testify tonight that whatever he tells me to say, I'll say it to whom he tells me and when he tells me. Walk out of that seat. Let a revolution start in your heart tonight. Draw me, Jesus. Not called of men, called of God. Though none go with me, I'll follow. I'll be a preacher of righteousness. I'll preach the truth. I'll be a guardian of the souls of humanity. Don't come halfway. Don't come halfway. He's not. I'm not looking. I'm not looking for a crowd. I'm not preaching for results. But if God's touching you, if God's touching you, come on. As the preacher goes, 
so goes the nation. Get as close as you can. Get as close as you can. Pastor Kayad and Pastor Petrie, Harold, come and join me. Mother Joni, come and join me. Where's Pastor Harrison? Pastor Harrison, come join me. Pastor Hubbard, come join me. Come on. Come on. Come on. Pastor Trice, Pastor Switzer. Brother Dalton, come and join me. Join me on this platform. Come on. Come on. Come on, snuggle in here. Come on. Snuggle in here. Give me my elders up here. Come on. Snuggle in here. Snuggle in as close as you can. Come on. Get as close as you can. 